This is the last sermon that I'll preach on Christmas this year. <laughs> so there's a reason that we're doing the wise men today, because the wise men came after Jesus' birth. Um, I mean, technically, so did the, the shepherds. You know, they came, but it was the same night. It was the same night as his birth, as we learned last time. But the wise men came a long time later. And people get that kind of wrong because they always see the cards with the, with the wise men and the shepherds and all that. And, you know, how many wise men were there? Well, Isaiah 60, verse 6, leads for the, the prophecy of it says a multitude of camels uh, bringing gifts like gold and frankincense. So Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, gives the impression that it was many, many, many. Uh, but there's only three gifts, so that's the reason they always say three wise men. It doesn't really matter. If it was that important, the Holy Spirit would have told us. So since they didn't tell us, it's, it doesn't matter. If, what if there were only three? Cool. Mm -hmm. What if just like Isaiah 60, verse 6, leads us to believe that there was a multitude? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. But to me, it's interesting to see the dates because um, everyone knows. I don't think there's anybody that actually thinks December 24th is... Hello. Well, I knew they were getting, I'm glad it happened at the beginning <laughs> and not into the lesson, so. I'm glad I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's grab some, some batteries and we'll take these out. You know, the funny thing is I switched Duracell from Rayovac. I don't think they last any longer. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the copper top, their reputation is not exactly stellar in my book. To me, they've lasted the same amount of time as Rayovac, and you'd think that Rayovac would not be as high quality as Duracell. So, now we're back. Okay. So, as we were saying before, I do not believe that anyone actually believes that Christmas is December 25th, right? I mean, I think that we all kind of have that notion that December 25th is a date that was selected by the Catholic Church um, because Constantine had selected it to coincide with all the different religions, uh, winter solstice, whenever there was a festival and there were things always happening with the pagans. And so whenever Constantine wanted to combine all of the pagan religions um, and have them all celebrate at the same time, he chose the winter solstice because it was the one that they all had in common except for Christianity. And he lumped Christmas in with that and made it the state religion that everyone had to follow. You were a pagan priest one day, and then all of a sudden you became a Catholic priest. Uh, that's, and so December 25th, I have the dates, I mean, it's a matter of history. Uh, the first recorded instance of December, being 20, uh, December 25th being Christmas is the Roman Emperor Constantine, 336 AD, 336 years after death, the year of our Lord, AD. Then it, made, it was made the official date in 350 AD, you know, some 14 years later, by the Pope. Pope Julius I. Why did he do that? I guess he didn't care so much. But I think we've learned that if the Catholics say it, you can almost bet that it's wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds funny, but it's kind of the way the, the trend goes. Uh, we know that it could not have been December 25th just by certain clues in the Bible. In the same region, there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. You're not going to find any shepherds past about mid-October. You're not going to find any shepherds out with their flocks in Israel. It's very cold. And it can, becomes very, it's hard to traverse. And so it's almost impassable, a lot of the terrain where these people would be. So you don't really find flocks past about mid-October. They stay in their, in their, uh, their pens, in their, their sheep folds. Now look what Jesus said. And pray that your flight... Uh, whenever you're running from the Antichrist, pray that your flight is not during winter or on the Sabbath. So why not during winter? Is December 25th winter? Yeah, because it's impassable. It's very difficult to traverse the land in that time of the year. So here we see that there are shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night, right? So that automatically tells you we're not talking December 25th here, right? I've done probably more research on the dates I'm about to show you than I'm sure other people have done more, but you know what? It's, it's hard to find it all in one place, I'll tell you that much. 
and it's not very widely spread. As a matter of fact, this is probably news to most of you, what we're about to go over. But if you take about a good week of your life and go through all of the ancient writings and all of the, the hints and the tips and the, and the clues that you can gather along the way, you'll probably come up with what I'm about to show you now. What I'm about to show you is just the product of many, 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 many hours and days of researching because I just wanted to know if we could find the real date of Christmas. And on top of that, the real date of when the wise men came. So here is the product of many hours and days of study. Okay, let's start with the dates that we're sure of and that we know and that are widely taught. August 5th, 70 AD, General Titus destroys the temple for the Romans, okay? Josephus was there. Josephus was born in 37 uh, AD, and he died in 100 AD. Now, the destruction of the temple was in 70, so he was in the prime of his life doing his historian job during all this time. So he was there. He described it uh, in his books, and so... Josephus lets us know August 5th, 70 AD, General Titus destroyed the temple. Now, one thing we also know, Josephus tells us, but the Bible also tells us. If you go to um, first, first Chronicles chapter 24, think of it like this. Whenever, you go to, whenever we get raptured to heaven, we're automatically put into companies of 24. Isn't it true that in chapter 4 and also in chapter 5, we see the 24 elders throwing their crowns before the throne? Why 24? Because in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, David, guided by the Holy Spirit, separated all the priests into companies of 24 for their rotation through the temple, to do their work in the temple. He divided them into companies of 24. Now, we've been made kings and priests through faith in Jesus Christ. And we know that it's talking about us in the rapture because Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 gives you the actual definition of who the 24 elders are. They're from every people, tribe, language, tongue. That cannot be talking about just the Jews because that's one nation, that's one tribe, that's one tongue. They're from every people, tongue, tribe, language. Okay, it's, it's all those redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You are worthy for you redeemed us with your blood from every people, tongue, tribe, language. Okay, so 24 priests, there are 24 orders of priests, First Chronicles 24, Josephus also told, tells us, Josephus tells us that the first order of the 24 orders, the first order had just finished when the temple was destroyed. The first order had just... Abiyah, which of course, in the English, anytime you see a J for a Hebrew word, you know that that's the Germanic influence and that it was a Y. Okay, so Abiyah, Abiyah. And from basic Hebrew, we already know what that means. Abi Yah. Okay, what, what does it mean when you say Abba Father? What does Abba mean? Daddy. Daddy is like what a kid would say, Daddy. Ab is dad. Or father. Ab. Okay? Abi, if you say Abi, it's my father. Hmm. Abi is my father. Just like whenever Jesus was on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakthani. Right? My God, my God, why do you forsake me? But my God, El E. El is Elohim, that's God. El. El E, the E means my God. El E. Okay? So whenever we say Abi, it means my father, my dad. And then change the J to a Y, as it should, because there is no J in the Hebrew language. So what do you have? My father Yah. My father Yahweh. So what does Abi Yah mean? It means my father Yahweh. My dad Yahweh. Hmm. Abi Yah is order number eight as Josephus tells us. Each order serves for one week. Now check out what Luke tells us, or Lucas if you want to learn some Spanish. Check out what Luke says to us that most people skip right by. They never pay any mind to this verse. There was a certain priest from the order of Abiyah. Look what the Bible already tells us from the same divisions from 1 Chronicles 24, whose name was Zacharias. When Zacharias' order... What do you mean order? First Chronicles 24. The 24 orders of the priests for the rotations. When Zacharias' order was on duty and Zacharias himself was serving as priest before God, 
He was chosen by lot to burn incense in the temple of Yahweh, the, temple, the altar of incense, just outside the, the veil leading to the Ark of the Covenant. According to the custom of the office of the priest. You see how the Bible gives us clues that we never would have understood if we didn't understand the history of it. So there's your Abiyah. My father is Yahweh. Abiyah. Okay. So, because there was never an interruption, there is no clue, no evidence of any interruption any time during the temple worship. Why would there be? That's their job. That, that's very sacred. We can simply go back in time, and we can learn from August 5th, 70 AD, the first order had just finished. We can go back to whenever Zechariah finishes his rotation based on around the times that we know that Jesus and John the Baptist were born. And we actually have a date on that, July 13th, 3 BC, 3 before Christ. Zechariah finishes his rotation. That's simple mathematics going back from the date that we already had. Now, nine months later approximately, go from July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, nine months. Nine months later, guess what falls right there just that nine months later? Passover. When do you think John the Baptist was born? Probably on that Passover. Probably on that Passover. And that would make sense because, does anyone have memorized John 1.29? It says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who said that? John the Baptist. He's the one that made the connection of Yahshua being the Passover Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Wouldn't it be fitting for John the Baptist to be born on Passover? And it just so happens to work out that way. So, we know that Jesus, Yahshua, was about six months later, right? Because Elizabeth was about six months pregnant whenever uh, Mary was pregnant with, with Jesus. But now, knowing whenever Jesus started his ministry because of Daniel 9, and knowing that Jesus could not begin his ministry until 30 years of age, why 30? Because being a priest, now he's under the order of Melchizedek, not under the Levitical priesthood, but... If the priestly ages are the same, you cannot begin assisting the priests, if you're a Levite, until you're 20. You cannot begin assisting the high priest until you're 25, and you cannot be high priest until you're 30. Okay, the divisions are very clear in the Old Testament. So we know that Jesus, that's why Jesus could not begin his, his ministry until 30 years of age, because he came to fulfill the law and to be our high priest and king, right? So, knowing that, that would put John's ministry beginning around April 20th, 29 AD. Now, let me show you something that Luke says. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, it was in those days that the word of God came to John, son of Zacharias, in the desert. When was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar? 29 AD. It, it falls into place. It works. It works. <laughs> now, six, six, uh, six months, um, John was six months ahead of Jesus, so if we, if we go from there to nine months, that places, and there's a feast day right there, and it's the Feast of Trumpets. Now, Jesus' birthday would have been if God keeps to his constantly using the feast days for his major mountaintops, September 29th, 2 B.C. And we've already known that because of Daniel's prophecy. We've already known that 2 B.C. was the date of Jesus' birth. And everything lines up. I'm going to show you so many proofs right now that it'll make your head spin till we know it's 2 B.C. when Jesus was born. Now, September 29th, that's the Feast of Trumpets. So if you ask me, I am convinced that Christmas is September 29th. That is the date of Christmas, September 29th. The shepherds would still be out in the field, keeping watch by night. We're not mid-October yet. Mm -hmm. And it just falls in perfect line with John the Baptist, with everything else, and it's a feast day. And check this out. What is the date, what is the feast that we are convinced will be the host of the rapture? Feast of Trumpets. At the final trumpet, we will be transformed. We will be changed. Wouldn't it be funny? If Jesus comes for his church on his birthday, mm -hmm. isn't that something? I believe Jesus was born on the Feast of Trumpets, and I believe he's going to rapture the church on his birthday. So, 
Tertullian. Who is Tertullian? He was born in 145. Now it depends on the source. You will find some sources, several sources that say that Tertullian was born in 145 AD. You'll find other sources that say that he was born in 160 AD. I don't think it matters. But he's a very respected theologian and scholar. Uh, Tertullian was the, uh, the father of um, Latin theology, and he was very good at defending against outside persecution and against inner heresy, from heresy happening uh, in, in, uh, inside the church. It was Tertullian, if you want some neat trivia, it was Tertullian who coined the word Trinity. Because the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word rapture is sort of in the Bible. The harpazo, the, the catching away, the, in the Latin, they translate that word harpazo into raptura. So the word rapture actually is in the Bible. Uh, first, first Thessalonians 4.17, you can find that. Uh, so harpazo in the Greek, the catching away, that you can translate that word rapture. So that actually is there. And when 1 John 5, 7, you know, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one, it introduces a triune God. Three persons, but in one being one God. They're one God. Same essence, three different people. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Remember what Jesus said in the garden. Let not my will be done, but let your will be done. Jesus didn't want to have to suffer that horrible weight of the sin coming on top of him. He was willing because it's the Father's will. But if he could find any other way, he wanted some other way. He said, if there's any other way, let this, pack, let this cup pass from you. Does it make any sense that if they're the same person, that's called mod modalism. Modalism is, is whenever you think that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same person, just at different times they act like the different person that they are. Kind of like schizophrenia. <laughs> Yahweh is not schizophrenic. <laughs> you have three personages, but it's one God, just like us. I have a mind which makes all the decisions, but my mind is not my body, and my mind is not my spirit. It's one of a trying being, which I am. I am John. I'm John Mind. You can't see my mind, but you know I have a mind because I'm reasoning, I'm speaking, I'm animated, right? I'm moving. You know that I'm alive because I have a spirit. You know that I have a spirit because I'm alive. What does James chapter 2 say? The body without the spirit is dead. What's dead? Every doctor has a different definition of what dead actually is. The Bible says once your spirit leaves your body, you are dead and there's no bringing you back except through God. So my spirit is not my mind. My mind is not my spirit or my body. My body is neither of the three, and neither of the other two. My body is my body. My body is the image of the invisible John. Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The Holy Spirit is the life giver. It was by the Father's will that all things were created. But who actually did the creating? Read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Read Colossians 1, verses 15 and 16 and 17. Read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and you'll come to a, to a startling conclusion that it was the Son, it was Yahweh Logos, who created everything physically. Yet, who breathed the life into it? The Holy Spirit. Who is responsible for us being born again? The Holy Spirit. So, you see the life giver being the Holy Spirit. You see the architect. You can look at it this way. The Father is like the architect. Yahshua is like the contractor the one actually doing the, the work, and then the Holy Spirit is like the electrician, putting life into it. Three different people in one God, just like I'm three different components in one man, right? Yet the difference is, is that I'm trapped in one spot. I'm finite. Yahweh, Elohim, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are interdependent. Though they're one God, they're not trapped in the same place at the same time. They commune with one another. They're one God, but they're not trapped within one another. Hard to understand, but that's an amazing truth that the Bible shows us. It's an amazing truth. They are co-equal. What is my mind without my body? What is my spirit without my mind? What is my body without the two of them? Right? So, Tertullian is the one who coined that word Trinity, because you don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, yet you find the truth of the Trinity all over the place. So, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, 
Here's what Tertullian says. Caesar Augustus began ruling 41 years before Christ and died 15 years after his birth. We know from history that Caesar Augustus died August 19, 14 AD. So Christ had to be born in 2 BC. So if he died 15 years afterwards, you simply have to, Caesar Augustus began ruling 41 years before Christ and died 15 years after Christ's birth. So you get 2 BC. Remembering, in order for this to work, you have to remember there's no such thing as zero, year zero. There's one BC and there's one AD. Once you finish one BC, you're automatically in one AD. There is no year zero, okay? So if you're thinking to yourself, how does that work? Now you, now you understand. Okay, Tertullian also tells us that Christ was born 28 years after the death of Cleopatra. Cleopatra was born 30 BC. What's 30 minus 28? Two. Christ was born 2 BC. Irenaeus, now who's Irenaeus? He was born 140 AD. Irenaeus was born 140 AD. He was a Greek cleric. That's what he did. He was known for theology and defending uh, against heresy, kind of like Tertullian. Very respected, very, very respected. Irenaeus says that Christ was born in the 41st year of the reign of Caesar Augustus. Well, Caesar's reign began in the fall of 43 BC. 43 minus 41 is 2. So do you see how not only does the Bible lead us in this direction, but history from noted scholars and theologians, the, the dates and the years line up. They line up just fine. So when would that place Yahshua's ministry when he turns 30 years old? September 29th, 29 BC. Um, September ministry, that should be AD, shouldn't it? I get confused sometimes. So September 29th, 29 AD, read that as AD. I should probably just change that. Uh, realize that September 29th, 29 after death, he begins his ministry. You know what? I can actually fix that so it doesn't confuse anybody. Fix April. You got April. What's that? You got April. A B I right? Where do you it's see like, that? It says break through four. The second line it says April. April. Well, just know that April is April. Okay. <laughs> because that's how you say it in Spanish. Oh, oh. So I write I all that. these in okay. Spanish. All right. So let me get us back to where we were. But so I don't confuse you with dates because sometimes I'm just going too fast and I put. B.C. instead of A.D. So we know that Yahshua's ministry began September 29th, 29 A.D. After, after, his, after the year of our Lord. A.D. means year of our Lord. So he didn't start his ministry before he was born. right? He started his ministry after he was born. So I'm sorry about that. I, I go too fast sometimes when I'm writing these things. So Yahshua began his ministry September 29th, 29 A.D. And that makes perfect sense. Because that's about six months later, whenever after John started his ministry, and then all of a sudden you have Yahshua coming up here. Here's John starting his ministry, preparing the way, and then here comes Yahshua on his birthday, September 29, 29 AD. Now, we already know from Daniel 29, from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, we've already been through the biggest prophecy in the Bible. I'll show it to you, to you again here tonight. The biggest prophecy in the Bible, when the Bible tells us the day... It prophesied 600 years in advance the very day that Jesus would proclaim himself king in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The Bible tells us that date. How do you think the wise men got there? We'll get to that. Some amazing insight you're about to receive. So Palm Sunday was April 6, 32 AD. The crucifixion, the day before Passover, April 9, 32 AD. And then, of course, April 12, which is Nisan 17. Passover is always Nisan 14, which is like our months are not coinciding with the Jews. So for the Jew, that's called Nisan 14. That's Passover. Nisan 17 is whenever the resurrection occurred. For us, on our calendar, our month begins in the beginning of at the middle of their month, because they're on a lunar calendar. April 12, 32 AD was the resurrection. Check that out. 9 and 12, at least in the Julian calendar, you get 21, 777. Pretty cool. Okay. Now. Now that we have the birth of Yahshua laid out, September 29th, 2 BC, using the Bible and using history to prove that date, September 29th, 2 BC, the birth of Yahshua, I'm going to show you historically and biblically, because it is absolutely impossible that the wise men came 
to the stable. It's impossible. They, they didn't go to Bethlehem to see Jesus. You know where the wise men went? They went to Nazareth of, Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus was no longer a baby. He was now a boy. I'm about to show you he was... Let me just let the cat out of the bag. And then we'll prove it. How about that? The wise men showed up bringing Jesus gifts on his one-year birthday. On Jesus' birthday of September 29th of 1 AD, on when Jesus turned one year old, the wise men show up to his birth, not in Bethlehem, but in Nazareth of Galilee. They were no longer in a stable. The Bible is going to say they went in the house. He's no longer a baby. The Greek is very precise. It no longer uses the word baby or infant for Jesus. It uses a child, not an infant anymore. I'll show you what I mean. Now, what do we know for a fact? We know that, uh, so here's the shepherds. Jesus was born September 29th, 2 BC, the birth of Joshua. The same night the shepherds came because the angel said, go and you'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. It was the same night. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, the Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. When did the shepherds go? The same night. The angels came singing their choruses, and they told them to go see him. And they went that night, and they saw baby Jesus right there in the stable. Now, what, what, what things do we know historically? We know the death of Herod, January 14th, 1 AD. That we know, January 14th, 1, year of our Lord, the death of Herod. Now, Josephus tells us that through his research that there was an eclipse just before, just before the death of Herod, almost like a sign. There was an eclipse. NASA can tell you the date of any eclipse that's ever happened. December 29th, 1 BC. That's literally what? There's 31 days in December, so like 16 days, is that right? 16 days before the death of Herod, there's an eclipse. December 29th, what's the day? The 27th? Well, imagine in two days, in two days, what will we be? We'll be on Saturday? Imagine on the, on the 29th of December, there's an eclipse, and then on January 14th, Herod dies. So 16 days later, Herod dies. And they, we know there's an eclipse just before his death. Well, there's an eclipse, December 29th, 1 BC. There are other eclipses that other people disagree with me on this, and they say, no, we don't think that was the eclipse because there was some other kind of eclipse on this day, but it, it does, it'll make everything fall apart, and it, it contradicts history and the Bible. So that means that after Herod died, on January 15th, 1 AD, they returned to Israel. Where had they gone? Egypt. After the wise men did not go back to see Herod, and Herod gets mad, he sends people out to kill the baby. Why weren't they caught? A couple of reasons. One, Herod thought they were in Bethlehem. They weren't in Bethlehem, they were in Nazareth, they were in Galilee. So, but what does the Bible say? That they went to Bethlehem and the surrounding areas, killing every baby, how old? Two years and under. Why two years? Mm -hmm. He didn't want to miss them. Mm -hmm. Why two years? Because he knew that the wise men were saying, he's, he's a year old today. We're here to celebrate his year, his first year birthday. Well, what if it's a year and one day? What if it's a year and three days? Herod was afraid he was going to miss the right baby. So what does he tell the, the mercenaries? He says, go kill every baby two years old and younger. Kill them all. They start in Bethlehem, which gives Jesus and Mary and Joseph a chance to get out of town. And, and uh, there are some awful things that happen. So, September 30th, 1 BC, is the slaughter. Why do we know that? Because the slaughter happened 3.5 months before his death. That's a matter of history. Uh, the slaughter occurred 3.5 months after, uh, before his death. So 3.5 months after the slaughter, Herod died. So therefore, how long was Jesus and Mary and Joseph in Egypt? 3.5 months. Now, with that being said, 
How do we know it's September 30th? Exactly one, that's 3.5 months, count it. From September 30th, 1 BC to January 14th, that's virtually 3.5 months. Now, we also know because Jesus, Mary, and Joseph left the very day after the wise men left, which was Jesus' birthday. The very next day. How do we know that? Because the wise men left, Joseph went to sleep, and it was during that night's sleep that he had the dream saying, get up and get your family to Egypt. So September 30th, just before they got there, is the flight to Egypt. They go to Egypt just before Herod's people go around the land, killing all the babies. September 29th was the night before, and that's the night whenever Joseph went to sleep and he had the dream that get out of town because they're coming to kill your baby. So September 29th, 1 BC, that's when the Magi visit Joshua. You see how this fits together? That would make the visit of the Magi, the visit of the wise men, one year to the day after Jesus' birth. They visited him and brought him presents on his birthday. Now, what I'm about to show you is that Mary and Joseph were no longer in Bethlehem in the stable a year later. As a matter of fact, I'm about to show you that 40 days after Joshua's birth, they were not only presenting him in the, in the temple, but they were going back to their hometown. Check this out. Leviticus, the law of Moses. What was Mary under? The law of Moses. What was Jesus under? The law of Moses. What did Jesus fulfill? The law of Moses. If a woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to a male child, she will be unclean for seven days, as if she were having her monthly menstruation. The male child is to have the flesh of his foreskin circumcised on the eighth day, the day after his mother becomes ceremonially clean again. Okay? Uh, she will be ceremonially unclean. It's not um, inherent uncleanness. It's not the woman becomes inherently unclean. It's a, ceremonially, it's a ceremonial uncleanness. You can't go in the temple during those days. Okay? It's holy territory. Um, when is the male child to be circumcised for medical reasons and for wonderful reasons that we've already studied that I don't want to go in here tonight, but for firing on the vitamin K, the coagulation. The day after the woman is declared ceremonially clean, on the eighth day, as if she were having a monthly menstruation. The male child is to have the flesh of his foreskin circumcised on the eighth day, the very next day. The woman must then wait another 33 days while her blood purifies her. Okay? How long is that? 33 plus the 7, you have 40 days. So, while her blood purifies her, during which time she may not touch anything sacred or enter the sanctuary. So, did Jesus, was Jesus presented in the temple to Anna and to Simeon for the first 40 days? No. 